Hello, and welcome to the Alabama Public Health Training Network. Thank you for joining us today for our program, HIPAA in Emergencies, Ethical Considerations During Disasters. If you have a question about anything being discussed today, please call or email during our broadcast. The phone number and email address are on your screen now and will appear again later in the program. Also, the handouts, sign-in sheet, and evaluation are all available online. You will need to register for this program in order to access those materials. Continuing education credits have been approved for nurses and social workers for today's program. In order to receive credit for this training, you must watch the entire program, then complete and return the sign-in sheet and evaluation. While content may continue to be relevant, continuing education credit will only be awarded for one year for nurses, expiring on July 31, 2016, and two years for social workers, expiring on July 31, 2017. Effective January 1, 2017, all licensed social workers in Alabama will be required to submit a total of three contact hours of ethics as a part of the 30 contact hours required for licensure renewal. This program has been approved for one contact hour of ethics continuing education for social workers. I'm Renee Carpenter, State Social Work Director for the Alabama Department of Public Health, and with me is Samaria Dunson, Director of the Alabama Department of Public Health Office of Compliance and Ethics. Welcome, Samaria. Thank you. Thank you. Um, there are a couple things that I'd like to discuss with you all today. Um, those topics are going to include um, who has to follow HIPAA regulations, um, what is considered to be protected health information, sharing data with other individuals, the minimum necessary rule, and disclosures to law enforcement. And Renee, before I begin um, to get, it, get further into the slides, I do want to do a brief overview of HIPAA. Now, I know right. that HIPAA is a little bit more exciting to me <laughs> than it is for everyone else, but I think that we all need to have a baseline understanding of how the HIPAA regulations came into effect. Um, back in 1996, what they were really looking at, it was originally called the Administrative Simplification Act of 1996. And the point was that they realized that they were spending so much of the health care dollar on administrative matters when it could really be going directly to health care. So they wanted to start doing uniform transactions. So a lot of times today when we think about HIPAA, we think about patient privacy. But at its inception, it was really just meant uh, to save money, you know, as, as people were making claims and transactions for insurance and payment and that type thing. Well, in realizing that they were about to move into the, the forethought of electronic health records and making all of this stuff electronic, they were also trying to think of, well, maybe we should start trying to make things a little bit more private as well. And so they began to put, you know, some information in that act in 1996 as it related to patient privacy. Another thing that they did in 1996 was to establish a baseline for all 50 states as it related to to patient and client information. Because what actually happened before then is that states had their own rules. So um, there were certain states that would say we wouldn't actually provide a patient with their own health care information. There were some states that would say, hey, I'll give it to another treating physician, but I won't give it to Ann Smith, even though it's her own record. So in 1996, when this took place, um, it actually um, established a baseline for all 50 states. Um, and you'll notice that we went from 1996 all the way to 2013, and then in that year we heard a big stir about HIPAA. I know I made a big deal about it here at the department, and that was because the rules had changed again. Well, they, had, they had changed again in 2003 and then again in 2013. And the reason that it was such a big deal in 2013 is that it really gave a lot of teeth to HIPAA as it related to patient rights and confidentiality. So now we start to get larger fines, criminal sanctions, and people really started to pay more attention to patient privacy. And that's how we get to today where when people hear the word HIPAA, they automatically think about confidentiality and patient rights. So I, I did want to start with that. Um, I know one of the things for discussion today has to do with who does HIPAA apply to? Well, it applies to covered entities. Um, it applies to health care providers, uh, doctor's offices, hospitals, nursing homes, assisted living facilities, hospices, all of those things that we would normally think of. It also applies to health plans, um, Medicaid, Blue Cross Blue Shield, any other entities that are paying 
for health care, um, in addition to clearing houses. And in 2013, in that, that big splash that we're all talking about, it also began to apply to business associates. And business associates are any of those entities that receive, create, maintain protected health information for a covered entity like the Department of Public Health and do something with that information on their behalf. Um, so an example of that that I always give has to do with like our shredding companies and a lot of the offices that you see there'll be the shredding bins and we'll put protected health information in those bins. Those companies will take the, the bin from the department um, and go off and shred them. So they're doing a service on our behalf and they're receiving protected health information. So as of 2013, those shredding companies have to comply with HIPAA. And then you get into business associate agreements and all the other kind of stuff that I really like to talk about that I'm not going to bore you all with <laughs> for this presentation. But those are all of the groups that, that would actually be covered by HIPAA. Um, so then I also want to talk about what protected health information is. It's individually identifiable health information about an individual's past, present, or future medical condition or mental condition transmitted or maintained in any form by a covered entity. So let's look at some examples of protected health information. Some of these really common ones that we all know, name, address, date of birth. I think some people forget about the date of service being a, a part of protected health information. We all know about social security numbers, especially in this time of identity theft. Uh, the diagnosis for a patient, their telephone number, and their email address. Some people may forget that those are also considered protected health information. And then we have a few more. Uh, they're going to be full face images or other comparable images of a patient. Um, the medical records number, now and for our department that could be our ADPH medical records number, it could also be Medicaid numbers that we have in our patient files. They're all considered to be that. And any other information of a patient or a client that can be used to identify that person. Now there are a couple things that are excluded. Um, and I know that I've mentioned this before in our general HIPAA training and that has to do with employment records. I may um, go out on FMLA, as I've done at least twice before. I won't be doing it again. <laughs> but I've gone out on FMLA for maternity leave. Um, in each of those instances, I've submitted uh, protected health information to the department as a part of my documentation for my FMLA. Um, because those are a part of my employment record and I'm not a patient or a client of the Alabama Department of Public Health, that's not considered to be PHI. Also, there is um, education records in the education setting. That's is not related to HIPAA, as John Weibel has taught me when I first started at Public Health. Um, that's FERPA. That's a whole other federal regulation that I won't even pretend to know everything about. But education records are also excluded. Um, I want to talk to you about routine disclosures and non-routine disclosures. Uh, routine disclosures are going to be whenever there is information provided for treatment, payment, and healthcare operation. And the reason that those three um, routine disclosures are important is that HIPAA is meant um, to keep a patient's information confidential, but it's not meant to interfere with the treatment or payment of their services. They want that those, those conversations to happen freely. So as an example with the treatment, if I'm at my general practitioner's office and my eye doctor contacts them because they need some information or I'm going in for surgery and they need information from another one of my doctors, they should be able to call that doctor's office and freely get that information. Uh, that's an exception for HIPAA for treatment purposes um, and it's considered a routine disclosure. Also for payment. If Blue Cross Blue Shield has a question about a claim that's being made by a physician, they don't need any type of authorization from me in order to talk with them about that claim. We want that information to pass freely for treatment, payment, and health care operations. Um, and let me, let me stop one minute um, before I move on to the next slide because I talked about covered entities and that's, that's who HIPAA applies to. One thing that I want to make sure that we all are on the same page about, because this was when I first started learning about, about HIPAA, it was a bit surprising to me. And it has that healthcare provider has to actually participate in electronic transactions in order for HIPAA to apply. Some people have a misconception that just because it's a physician, they have to comply with HIPAA. Now, I would imagine that there are very few healthcare providers that are only accepting cash. They're not doing any insurance. They're not doing any credit cards or anything like that. I might be 
a little suspicious about a practice like that. I don't know. I've never seen that. But you have to have electronic transactions in order for HIPAA to apply. Um, so if somebody's just accepting cash, no electronic health, um, no electronic transactions, they may not be covered. And so I just wanted to, to kind of stop myself and make that note. Now, uh, let's talk about disclosures to public health um, for public health activities. Um, you can disclose information uh, to public health authorities, and I wanted to explain who public health authorities are. They're going to be agencies or authorities of the United States um, that are responsible for public health matters that are a part of their official mandate. So some examples of that would, would absolutely include the Alabama Department of Public Health as a state agency. It would include our local health departments. Um, it would also include entities like the Center for Disease Control. All of those would be considered public health authorities. Um, and so when can disclosures be made to those, in the, to, to those entities? It's whenever they're authorized by law to collect or receive information for the purpose of preventing or controlling disease, injury, or disability. So an example of that might include um, here at our department when we collect information for disease control. You know, we, we have a lot of information as it relates to who has STDs or other notifiable diseases across the state. And so they have to report that information to us by law because we're authorized to collect that information. So um, they're, by, by law, they're actually required to make those disclosures to us. And um, the, the last question on that slide is, when can a public health authority require the release of information to a third party? Well, there may be instances where we as a department or where the Center for Disease Control actually contracts with another entity to collect information. And I've actually kind of seen those come in before where they're requesting the release of information. Um, what, what the message I want to get out to our employees about that is that if you receive a letter or a document saying, hey, I'm associated with this public health authority, give me some information. I don't want our employees making the decision about whether or not they should make the disclosure. I'd like for them to contact the Office of General Counsel, fax them a copy of that letter, scan it in, email it to them. Let our legal office be the group to, make, to decide whether or not to make that disclosure. Because one thing that, that I always think about um, is with us being the Department of Public Health, we can't really afford the embarrassment of disclosing some information erroneously. Um, so we always want to make sure that we are uh, having that information double-checked with our legal office before we begin making any type of disclosure um, like that. But that, those are examples of public health authorities and when information can be provided to them. Let's see. Our next slide talks about additional disclosures. Um, when can you disclose information to family and friends? And this is that's a really interesting interesting topic because it's very different during an emergency than it would be in what I would call normal times, like today. I really hope today is a normal day, <laughs> but I expect today to be a normal day. And for today, if a mother contacted one of our health departments and she wanted to find out if her daughter, Susie Smith, was a patient, well, if the mother didn't bring that child or bring that 15-year-old to the department, uh, for services, the reaction from our county health department would not be to tell the mother that the, that, that person was a patient. If the 15-year-old brought herself, um, we know to keep that information confidential. But during an emergency, I won't at all say that the HIPAA rules are thrown out the window but because they're not. The infrastructure is still there, but they're a bit relaxed because we want to make sure that, that we're allowing family and friends to have as much information that they need in order to help the patient. So uh, going forward with that, the rule for family and friends is, number one, you can share protected health information with them if they are involved in the patient's care. So let's say um, that whether or not it's the health department or if they're at a hospital and those two entities know, hey, every time Samaria Dunson comes in, Mario Munderland, who's my mom, is there with her. She has maybe some paper. You know, a lot of times we sign paperwork to say, hey, you can talk about my record with this person. You know, they can look back at those files and share that information. But especially during an emergency, you can share information about a patient as necessary to identify, locate, um, or notify family members, guardians, or anyone else that's responsible for that patient's care of the patient's location, of their general condition, or of their death. And recently I was at a conference and one of the presenters was talking about this multiple car accident that happened. And 
involved in that accident, there were several teenagers. And those teenagers, because it, the, the, the pileup was so significant, a lot of the people were taken to separate hospitals. So the parents, frantic, calling the hospitals, wanting to know if their 17-year-old was at that hospital. And the reaction initially of the hospitals was not to disclose that information. And I remember um, that one of the the individuals, she was saying that one of the individuals at the hospitals was saying, hey, this is ridiculous. Like, we got to make sure that these parents are hooked together with these teens because they need to help make some health care decisions uh, um, for these teenagers. And uh, I know guidance was later issued um, by HHS, actually in 2014 and again in 2015, to say, everybody, basically, let's use our common sense when it d to deal with issues like this. There are instances that, that it's more relaxed, where, where the rules are more relaxed, where you can share uh, that type of information with family and friends. So we can share that the person is there, their general condition, and whether or not that person is deceased. So that's some information that we can share with the family and friends. What, can, you, can you further define what an emergency is? Because I know with, with public health, we often think of, of an emergency as a declared disaster. And it is. Okay. It is. It, it is like that. It's uh, um, where, where either the Department of Health and Human Services or the president or the governor has actually issued an emergency. It's not because I'm sitting in my office and I go, oh my gosh, I think this is an emergency. <laughs> you know, it needs to be higher than that. It needs to be a higher level government official that's stating, yes, this is an emergency situation. Okay. But, but also in the, the, the example that I gave about the car accident, mm -hmm. that, that's kind of a different a whole different animal um, because that's just providing locating information. You're not really going into depth about specific PHI about the patient. Um, so in that example, that's obviously not um, a hurricane or anything like that. That's just kind of everybody using their common sense to make sure that they're helping the patient because that's the goal is that everybody wants to make sure that we're helping the patient. Okay. Does that answer your question? Yes, it does. Okay. <laughs> um, so what if you are aware of an imminent threat to someone's health and safety? Um, the example that I always think of when we talk about an imminent threat to someone's health and safety, and it's probably because I work for public health, <laughs> but this is what comes to mind is, I think of a situation where somebody has come in for STD testing. Um, when they get to the health department, they find out they're positive for a particular STD. They know that maybe they're married or they've only had one partner. They are outraged. They're telling everybody what all they're going to do to that person. When they leave, you know, I'm going to kill them, I'm going to shoot them. They're very emotional, that type of thing. Our nurses and social workers hear that. So then the question is, well, what can they do? Well, one thing that I don't want you to do is to call that partner <laughs> and give them a heads up. That, that's, not, that's not your job to do that. Um, any situation where you feel that someone is, there's an immediate, there's an imminent threat to someone's health and safety, I want you to, again, call the Office of General Counsel for guidance. And I want you to tell them, I want you to very quickly, and if you, if you get through all the lawyers and for some reason they're not there and they're generally there, call me. <laughs> I want, you, you need to have somebody here at the tower that's actually giving you that, that's, that's helping you think through that situation. Um, so you want to, to, to go ahead and do that, contact the Office of General Counsel, and they can give you guidance as to whether or not, yeah, this is a situation where we might need to call the police, get them involved, that type of thing. Um, and they can decide what information needs to be shared in order to reduce that threat of health and safety for that other person. Uh, but that is an example of during, during an emergency situation, because that is an emergency, <laughs> um, where, um, where you might share information with someone else. Um, another thing is, has to do with whether or not you can share information with the media. Um, and this comes up a good bit because, you know, as you're listening to the news, you hear these media outlets saying all kinds of things about individuals' health conditions. And you're going, well, you know, how did, how did they figure that out? Um, well, let me just say this. In general, um, an example that I'll give is a hospital. Unless somebody opts out of being on their directory, um, they could say, yes, Samaria Dunson is, has become a patient at Baptist Hospital. Um, yes, she's in stable condition or she's in ICU. They can, they can say those general things. They cannot give more specific information about your health condition. Um, I remember, and, and I think everybody will remember back during the 4th of July holiday, 
there was this athlete, and I don't pretend to know like everything about football. I know about Alabama football, <laughs> but I don't know about everything. Uh, and I'll say that um, there was a, a football player. He was in the midst of signing a multi-million dollar contract. Um, he decided it would be a wise decision to play with fireworks on the 4th of July. Um, he's holding the firework. It blows up in his hand. Um, later on, um, they say on the news that the team found out that his actual NFL team found out about this accident over, I believe, like Twitter or some social media site. Um, and so his privacy, his uh, related to his protected health information, came into question. And there were these big debates about whether or not ESPN violated his rights. ESPN can't violate his rights. They're not a covered entity. Only the hospital who would have had access, the person at the hospital who would have had access to his medical records and provided it to ESPN, that person may be liable criminally or civilly. But ESPN cannot be because they're just a news outlet that's sharing information that has been shared with them. So um, when we, I know that when I'm watching sports and I hear that somebody has been injured, the media will give Sometimes I, I consider a lot of information about that person's um, health care, uh, what's going on with their status. The health care entity that's treating them may provide general, vague information, but generally it's the team that's reporting those types of additional specific information. And that's why you're, when, you're, when you're watching TV, you're getting more information than what the health care entity is actually allowed to provide. So I just wanted to make that point. Um, and then also um, individuals can share information um, through the directories. You know, like if you are in the hospital, you're having a baby, they want to know where you can send the flowers, that kind of thing. Um, generally, when you're, when you're signing in to the hospital, they will allow you to opt in or opt out of those facility directories. So the next slide talks about waivers. Who can provide a waiver for, um, for under the HIPAA privacy rule? Well, let me say that these waivers um, are really pretty serious. The President of the United States has to decide that there's been a disaster or an emergency. And the Secretary for the Department of Health and Human Services has to agree that this is, the, that this is an emergency situation. When both of those things happen together, they can issue a waiver. And there are certain um, terms that go along with that waiver. Um, one of the terms is that, it, that the waiver only exists for that specific emergency area that's listed in the waiver. So they may say a specific region or a specific um, facility that, that may receive that waiver. Also, the hospital that's participating in that waiver has to have instituted disaster protocol. You know, this isn't just your regular old basic run of the mill. Like, they're, they're prepared for this waiver to come, and they've in instituted their protocol. And it can only last for 72 hours. So it's not if, if you are a healthcare entity, they've provided you a waiver, um, and you are operating under that waiver, this waiver is only going to last for that 72-hour period. You can't go back three weeks from now and say, oh, well, I made that disclosure, and the privacy rule was, was relaxed for me because I, had gotten a because I got a waiver. Well, that waiver was for 72 hours. And, and no longer after that. So there are instances when there is a waiver. I don't think that the Department of Public Health is in danger <laughs> of receiving these anytime soon. I've not had that experience, and I've been here for almost 10 years. Um, but one thing that you can count on is that there is, if there is a waiver, we will provide instruction. The Office of General Counsel will provide instructions um, and I keep forgetting that I'm not in that office anymore. <laughs> but I would work with the Office of General Counsel so that they could provide that instruction to you. So that's, I wanted you to be aware of it, but it's not something that you need to be prepared for opening the mail and you're going to be receiving that yourself. Can those waivers be renewed after 72 they hours? They can. Okay. They can. Uh, and they can also be reduced. Um, if for some reason they decide, oh, it didn't need to be for a 72-hour period and we're pulling that back, they can, they can reduce that amount of time to any time short of that 72-hour period. Well, I'm thinking about Hurricane Katrina, which was a very long disaster. Right. It lasted for a very long period of time. Right, and you couldn't have anticipated right. yeah, how long okay. that, would, that would last. Yeah. So um, that's, that's it as it relates to waivers. Um, it may be difficult for you to see, and Renee and I have discussed the possibility <laughs> of emailing this slide out right. or having it available. Um, I thank goodness I have a copy <laughs> here for myself, but um, what this is, is is from the Department of Health and Human Services website. I'd like for you all to review it as you have time. I think it's, it's really 
handy. Um, I, I really like these flow charts. That, that show you, hey, if I answer yes to this question, I move here. If I answer no to this question, I move here. Um, I think it, I, I've, I've reviewed this, and I think it obviously is, is making the right decisions in each instance. But those green boxes that you see, they just, they're boxes that are the conclusion. So it says, yeah, you can, under these circumstances, if you reach this box, you can disclose information. Or if you reach this particular box, you can't disclose information. And in some of the boxes, what they're saying is, yeah, you can disclose the information, but you have to only disclose the minimum amount of information necessary for, uh, for, you, for, for that entity to get what they need. And in talking about the minimum necessary rule, I think that that brings us to this next slide. So um, in, in terms of our department, uh, department personnel who are directly involved in a patient's treatment and care may have access to all of that patient's protected health information. So our doctors, our nurses, our social workers, um, if they're treating a patient, they can get all of the information. But if you're not directly involved in that patient's care, you cannot have unlimited access to their record. Um, and it is a violation of the minimum necessary rule for any type of health care provider to access the PHI of a patient that they don't have a treatment relationship with unless it's for research purposes. And um, that, that's a topic for a, a whole other day. <laughs> but, um, and and we, don't, we don't really do a lot of research here. I know our institutional review board will, will look at those types of disclosures. But for the most part, gang, if you are treating a patient, you can see their record to the extent that, that you need to look at it in order to make your decisions. But if you don't have a, if you're not treating that patient, you don't have a need to have their record at all. You know, unless it's a clerical person that's putting some information in and they have a need to use it to put that information in, uh, that can, can, you can end up getting all types of personnel action because of that, um, because it, that's considered a, a breach. Now, it's within our workforce. We don't have to report any of those things, but it is a violation of the minimum necessary rule for you to look at information on a patient that you do not have a treatment relationship with. Now, as with almost all rules, there are some exceptions, <laughs> and I want to go over those exceptions now. Um, it doesn't apply in the following, following circumstances. If it's for treatment, um, and an example of that would be this, a doctor's office calls the Coleman County Health Department and they want Samaria Dunson's records. You're going to give them everything that you have on Samaria Dunson, because what it is it's about is, is the continuity of care and being able to provide them with everything that they might need. We don't, when, when, a, when another um, treating physician or provider contacts us and want inf wants information, we don't make a decision about what they need and what they don't need. We provide them the entire record because they, they really do need that information, everything. Um, also, uses and disclosures um, to a patient. Um, so somebody comes in, or their legal representative, so someone comes in and they say, hey, I want a copy of my entire medical file. Well, we don't say, well, we'll give you these pages and we'll keep the rest. It's their right to be able to get a copy of their medical record, and we will give them the entire record. The only thing that we would not give them has to do with their psychotherapy notes, and we never have to do that. We never give those psychotherapy notes out. Um, another exception has to do with... Um, the, with disclosures that pursue it to an authorization. Um, one example that I can think of has to do with um, like third party authorizations. You want to give your lawyer a copy of your whole medical record. So I come in, I fill out the CHR 6, I say I wanted to go to whichever law firm, I won't get in trouble if I mention one. Um, you want the information to go to one particular law firm, you'll give them, and I check you know, my entire medical record, because we want to make sure that we're only giving out what they want. But if, you check, if they check the entire medical record, we're going to give them the whole file. Um, the disclosures that are made to the Secretary of the Department of Health and Human Services um, for enforcement of the privacy regulations. Um, I cannot stress this point enough. If the Department of Health and Human Services, which houses the Office of Civil Rights, which is also known as the HIPAA police, want patient information as a part of their job, I can't give it to them fast enough. I can, if, can we FedEx it? Can we UPS it? Can I drive it up to the Atlanta Regional Office? We're giving them everything that they're requesting. By law, they're owed that information. So that's an exception to the minimum necessary rule. Another exception has to be disclosures that are made by law. Um, some of these are going to include um, subpoenas 
orders, for judicial orders, for information, uh, matters of national security, which I've not come across yet, but I do know that it's a part of the regulations, um, and also uses and dis disclosures that are required for compliance with those standardized transactions that we talked about before. Those are all um, exceptions to the minimum necessary rule. Now let's see. Um, I also want to talk with you a little, little bit about these HIPAA orders that we receive. Um, any of you all who do any work as it relates to disclosures where you might receive a subpoena for a patient's information, um, we don't give out health information based specifically on a subpoena. Generally, there has to be what we call a HIPAA order or other, uh, a protective order, other types of um, disclosures that are made. And, and what those orders basically say is, I understand that this is protected health information. I understand that this is covered by HIPAA. I will keep this information confidential. At the close of this litigation, I'll make sure that I either destroy the information or return it back to the covered entity. So we're still looking out for patient privacy. Um, so that's what that, the, those, that HIPAA orders section is about. You don't need to worry about being an expert on HIPAA orders. If you receive anything even like that, give it to the Office of General Counsel. Let them worry about it. Um, and and, and that also has to do with disclosures that are required by law. Um, again, I don't expect for you to be HIPAA experts. I'll let you know if it's a disclosure that's required by law. You don't need to try to Google and memorize all of them. I've done that. <laughs> um, but the significant thing that I really want to talk about has to do with the identification and, and location, um, making, disclo well, making disclosures to law enforcement for identification and location purposes. Now, this actually happens a good bit. We have a person that comes into the health department, they've got a badge, they've got a gun, they look pretty intimidating, they want some of our medical records. Your first inclination is, yes, <laughs> I want to give it to you. Well, they can only get certain information. So when they come in, uh, we, we try to be very responsive because we want to work with them. Um, but you can only provide them with specific information. You can provide them with a name or an address of a patient. You can provide them with information about what the person's um, physical characteristics are. You can say, oh, yeah, that person's 5'10", about 120 pounds. Um, they may ask you, hey, you know, I'm really looking for this particular suspect. Can you tell me when their next appointment is? So you can say, oh, they have an appointment on Thursday that type thing. Uh, what you, and let me also say this, when those situations happen, we don't want to disturb the peace within our county health department. We don't want our patients to think that when they come to the health department, they're going to get arrested. So what we always say is, look, you know, officer, we, we'd love to work with you. We understand that you have a legal right to come here and ask these questions. If you would have a seat in the lobby, when that person gets here, I'll let you know that that person is here. I'll tell you what that person is wearing. You cannot come back in the clinic while that person is receiving their treatment. Um, but when that person steps outside of the health department and they get to the parking lot, whatever business or whatever matter you have with that person, you're welcome to take care of that at that time. It's very important to note, though, we're not telling them why they're coming. We're not giving the rest of that health information. We're not giving them diagnosis. We're not telling them that they're there for family planning or anything like that. We're just giving where they are, their location, name and address, and, and things that they can use to identify that particular individual. How would that scenario play out in, say, a mass care shelter during a disaster? Well, it's hard to think about somebody going and getting arrested during <laughs> an actual disaster, um, but they can still give those same identifiers. You know, if I'm there and I have on a, a, bl a bloody blue suit, um, they say I'm 5'7", maybe 120 pounds. <laughs> I hope they would be kind to say that. Um, but it's those same types of identifiers that they can give. But hopefully we don't have any shelters that say STD shelter, you know, family planning shelter, high blood pressure shelter. So they're still not getting more information as it relates to their health care. They're just looking for a particular individual based on some physical characteristics. Okay. Um, and the last thing on this slide has to do with uh, sexually transmitted diseases. And I just threw this in there. It doesn't necessarily have to do with law enforcement because we certainly aren't telling law enforcement about um, sexually transmitted diseases, but I have AL out to the side. And the reason that I have that is 
we're not dis we're, the reason that we're not disclosing sexually transmitted diseases isn't a HIPAA issue. HIPAA treats sexually transmitted diseases just as they would any other type of condition or diagnosis. It, but it's Alabama law. We have specific rules and statutes in place for protecting um, individuals with notifiable diseases, sexually transmitted diseases within our state. So it's even more um, strict than what HIPAA would actually allow. And I just wanted for our employees to be aware of that. Um, looks like we're doing pretty good on time. Mm -hmm. Um, so this is a chart. Um, you all see this because I know y'all play a lot of attention to the HIPAA training and refresher training. And so I'm sure that you've seen this chart before. And this has a, this shows the civil monetary penalties. Um, this is a, the newest one since 2013 where we all got really scared because if you look, you'll see, you know, even if a, a provider didn't know, um, for the first violation, it could be anywhere between $150,000 and the list goes on. Um, it, down to willful neglect. Um, it wasn't until I actually started going to these conferences that I realized that there are actually some people or some some healthcare providers that don't respond to HHS, which I think is ridiculous. You know, they 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 ask them for information, they ask to provide information, they don't give it to them. That they end up getting, you know, they're the ones with the multi-million dollar fines and that type thing. But this chart shows you that. You also notice that um, only in certain bureaus in our department where we see a lot of breach activity, um, or let me say this, we don't have a lot of breach activity in the department, but where we see more activity than in other areas, I'll come in and do a refresher training. Because what we don't want to happen is this last column where it says identical violations in the same calendar year. What HHS expects for us to do when we see breach, when we see these types of things happening is they want us to look at them, assess them, and do something about them to prevent them from happening again in the future. So if I see areas where it seems to be a repetition of the same thing, we want to make sure that we have documented refresher training where we're educating employees so we can keep that, so that we can keep those types of activities from continuing to happen. But if you notice that, you know, that's quite large to continue to have the same types of, um, of the, the identical um, types of violations in the same calendar year. And then obviously the um, ARA, the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act, um, started allowing for criminal penalties associated with these types of violations in, in terms of wrongfully disclosing um, patient information. Now, I think this might be the point where we can start getting into a few questions, if anybody has any. I, I do have a question. Okay. As it relates to a, a medical need shelter where we might be providing health care and um, though we might not be billing or we might not be putting that information into an electronic system, mm -hmm. how how does uh, HIPAA relate to that? maybe that situation? Okay, the people that are going to be operating these shelters are covered entities in and of themselves. You know, like so if the Department of Public Health is doing a, a need shelter or um, the, so in some ways, the state of Alabama has gotten these other health care providers to do that. Because you're a health care provider, you, you're subject to HIPAA wherever you are, as long as you're acting within that, when you're performing that type of job. So just because you're not in an ADPH building, if you're a nurse, if you're a social worker, if you are a health care provider of any sort, and you're in the business of providing health care where you are, you need to make sure that that you're acting as if you're in a county health department. You're keeping the information secure. That's very difficult to do in a shelter setting when beds are literally as close as you and I are right now. Right. So how would, how would we keep that information private when anyone can overhear what we're saying? Well, let me, let me also make this point. Um, during an emergency situation like you're talking about, the, the infrastructure for HIPAA is still there. But the, the rules are a bit more lax. And even in, in, in normal times, as I said, I've said before, there is room for incidental disclosures. So at one example might be if you're in a hospital, you're walking past a doctor or a nurse, and you hear them discussing somebody's record where they're not intentionally doing it. It was an incidental disclosure. And I would imagine that you would have a number of incidental disclosures in a setting like you're talking about just because you don't have walls and doors that actually separate people. Now that doesn't mean that you then have the right to get on a bullhorn and be like, hey, all the people who have this type of condition on the left, you know, everybody else on the right. Like you're not, you, it doesn't allow you the opportunity to purposely 
violate the privacy rule with HIPAA, but it certainly allows for the opportunity for those types of incidental disclosures to be made. Um, and one thing I want to note, too, in terms of the Department of Public Health, I can't speak for other healthcare entities, but one thing that we want to make sure that we do is in terms of maybe the laptops that we might take out on site and that type of thing. We want to make sure that that information is encrypted. So if we lose patient information within that laptop, if we have jump drives, let's make sure that they are encrypted jump drives so that we are, we are preparing ahead of time not to violate people's confidentiality because we know we're going to be in a hurry during an emergency. We know somebody could pick up somebody else's laptop while you're in a shelter and may go missing, that type of thing. We want to make sure that we're doing everything that we can to safeguard protected health information, even in a setting where the privacy rule might be a, a bit more lax. Okay. Does that make sense? Yes. I'm so excited to see you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, what about HIPAA and social media, such as Facebook and Twitter that you mentioned and other such things? Is there a can the two things coexist? They can. And, and let me just say the reason why I'm saying I'm so excited to see John Weibel is he's the one who introduced me to HIPAA in the very first place. <laughs> I learned all of the basics for everything that I know about HIPAA from him. So it's just it's really good to see you. Um, as it relates to social media, they can coexist, but you have to be extremely careful. We've had some experiences with social media as it relates to our patients and with our employees. So let me give a couple of examples if I can. Um, one, one thing that we tell our employees during HIPAA training is if you're on, on Facebook, don't give medical advice on Facebook. People are going to, no matter what position or classification you have at the department, people are going to think that you know what you're talking about because you work for the Department of Public Health. If you see somebody at, you know, one of, one of your Facebook friends in the lobby, don't go on Facebook and say, hey, it was great to see you at the health department today, you know, or it was great to see you today at work if people know that you work, because people can know that you work for the department. You want to be careful with that. We want to be careful about pictures that we take. Um, this, I have some younger nieces and nephews. I've, I used to be young when I first started working here. I'm not so young anymore. <laughs> but I pick up these, these terms that they use because especially our younger population is, is like, they're almost like obsessed with social media. And they, they, they're constantly taking pictures and selfies and uh, the term that they call it is doing the most. You know, like so-and-so's doing the most on Instagram or they're doing the most on Facebook. And some examples that I can see with our employees is you, you think your outfit's cute today. You like your makeup. You turn to take a picture and there's some medical records in the background. Or you turn to take a picture and there's a patient walking by. So you have it on Facebook. It's on your Facebook page. You didn't intend to really disclose somebody's information, but it just so happened that their information is now there on Facebook, and, and you're creating a breach situation because people on social media that need to know that John Doe was at that health department that day. Um, we've also had instances of um, our, our patients talking on Facebook about their health condition, and maybe an employee chimes in on that conversation. Don't do that. If somebody wants to talk about themselves and, oh, my gosh, I can't believe I got a positive pregnancy test and all that kind of stuff, you don't need to, you know, be on there saying, yeah, I can see the tears in your eyes today or, yeah, you know, it's going to be okay. Leave that alone. You, you, you just are not allowed to, to, because of where you work, you can't interact with people on social media websites like you would if you did not work for the Department of Public Health. So social media is actually, um, it can actually be very helpful to public health. This is a way that allows you to communicate with a lot of people about educational information that you're trying to provide. But when it comes to our patients and their privacy, we have to be extremely careful and delicate with how we handle that. I know during disasters, a lot of times there are Facebook pages that are set up. Mm -hmm. specifically for that, that disaster, maybe right. for a shelter. Uh, during the Tuscaloosa tornadoes, there was a group of Auburn students uh, called uh, Tumors for Tuscaloosa mm -hmm. that they wanted to know what items were needed in Tuscaloosa so that they could then get those items together and bring them over. Right. Is that something that could, could be used? Yeah, that sounds fair because in, in, in each of those examples that you gave, you're not saying, 
And Samaria Dunson had to be rushed to DHR because she got her arm amputated. You know, that, that's just talking about items that are needed, um, like a, a charity type thing. Right. I remember that when we were doing the, when, the, when they were the reenacting for the marches in Selma, mm -hmm. um, there were a lot, of, a lot of our employees came down to work, uh, you know, medical shelters and that type thing in case there were any incidents. And they took pictures. Mm -hmm. And we actually went through those pictures to make sure, okay, in none of these pictures is there any health information, in none of these pictures is there a client or a patient that was served in a medical capacity before we actually allowed those to be a part of what they were trying to advertise. Um, so we, it's not that, that social media can't be used, you just have to be careful with it, and we want to make sure that there are a number of eyes that look at it before we put that information out there. And one thing that I always say is, because we are a regulatory entity, so many of the aspects of our department uh, regulate other entities or individuals. We have to be extra careful that we are not making violations. Right. So that's why we kind of go through things with a fine tooth comb. What if in a shelter setting, uh, one of the residents wants one of our employees to take their picture so that they can fo post it on Facebook? Is that allowable? That's a really good question. I don't see why that's not allowable. Um, I wouldn't suggest it, <laughs> but so don't I make guess the I offer. Can. Yeah, don't make the offer. <laughs> don't make the offer. Don't do that. Because um, I also remember at the conference they were saying that um, there was a they were given an example that that had actually taken place. It was a patient. They were in the hospital, and the employee was in the background, kind of doing some work. And, oh, I know what it was. Um, somebody took a picture of the patient. The patient didn't authorize it, but the pa there was somebody who took a picture of the patient, I guess, in passing by the room, and the employee was kind of in the background, you know, doing like the peace signs as if they were posing for the picture. So they got in major trouble because it wasn't authorized by the patient, but they knew they could see that the image was being taken. And so that got to be a problem for that particular employee. So we want to be we want to be kind of leery and careful as it relates to pictures. Now, in our health departments, there are signs up that say no cell phones. No cell phones past this point. Then you don't have to worry about being recorded, pictures being taken of other patients, that type of thing. Because I can tell you one thing, and I guess I probably watch a little too much Maury Povich <laughs> or, other, or other, um, um, other types of programs like that. But one thing that, that you see a lot nowadays is um, we're girlfriends, like we're, we're friends. Um, I see, you know, who I think is your boyfriend, and he's, this, 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 for, for this example, at the health department. And I go, Renee's not going to believe this. I'm going to, you know, I'm going to snap a picture real quick so that, that she can see that he's with that person. Like, these things, if, if, if you weren't as nosy as I am, you wouldn't even think that, that they're going on, but they do. So we don't allow that in um, our county health departments. It may not be bad that unless there is a need to take photos in a medical needs shelter, you might consider saying, hey, can we, can we reduce this in the shelter? We don't need this activity. This is for an emergency. Let's focus on health care and not necessarily pictures or social media. Well, and I know social media is one monster in and of itself, but the news media can also be another one during yes, disasters. They can. And oftentimes they're going to want to come into the shelter and videotape what's going on because it's a great human interest story. Right. How should our folks handle that? And, they, and one thing that I can say, too, is they're very persistent. Yes. <laughs> yes. yes. <laughs> I've experienced that. Um, but what I would say is my personal opinion is they don't need to be in there looking all over the patients. Now, they can take some images and do some recordings outside the shelter, and you may say, hey, you know, you know go in and say, hey, you know, is there anybody in here that would like to be interviewed by this particular news outlet or anything like that. And, and I've actually seen that happen where somebody says, well, I'll volunteer to do it. I, I don't have any problem with that. They sign the little disclosure that they have with them. And they're doing that on their own. We're not saying or giving them the impression that in order to receive health care, they need to cooperate with this news outlet. But they're, they're free people, <laughs> you know, so they can, they can come out of the medical needs shelter or you can, if they're right at the beginning of the shelter, depending on how this 10 or however it is is set up if if they say I want to be a part of this news story you can there's a way for you to take an image of that person or interview them without seeing the other happenings or other individuals within that shelter so I would I would kind of look at it that way okay
Do we have any other questions or phone calls? Just a follow-up question. Uh, at a family assistance center where we're not providing health care, what about the media coming in in a facility like that? What? I'm sorry, I'm not so familiar with the federal, a family assistance center. It, it would be is when, that like was, when Red Cross or somebody is well, trying to Well, it would be when there was a, a mass casualty and okay. we're, we're working with the families um, to help identify those uh, loved ones. Um, okay. Well, let me say, if, if PHI is not involved, you don't have a HIPAA problem. Uh, but I would imagine that that's kind of insensitive. You know, if I were looking for my mom or my dad and I was standing in the line because I'm upset, I'd hate to see my image now on the news as they're describing this situation. It, it just, uh, my thought is that it's insensitive. It's not a HIPAA issue, though, because there is no possibility of protected health information being shared if there's no health information at that family assistance center. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Are there any other questions? I do have one. It came in. Uh, after a disaster, the Red Cross sets up a safe and well registry. Mm -hmm. What's the department's position upon this registry? We share information with them, and, and by law we're allowed to do that. Uh, because they're actually, you know how when we talked about sharing information with family and friends and how you could actually do that, the, the, like the American Red Cross, like they, they actually work to assist with that. So we can spend a lot more of our time actually providing health care while they're handling that. So actually HHS has, has actually is, issued guidance saying it's okay to freely share information with them so that they can help you specifically with helping out with the family, friends, caregivers. And I guess it, it could be a good idea to find out if the residents in that shelter want that information shared. Right. Uh, not everyone who's lost wants to be found. But that's true. Uh, <laughs> that's if, true. If they're running it from a domestic violence situation, for example. That's true. And, and what the guidance actually says is that you need to use your professional judgment. So, you know, in conversing with a patient and you think that they are of their right mind and they're saying, I really don't want this done, then you need to respect their wishes. A lot of times what happens is a person could be incapacitated or, un or you know, they're unable to make those types of decisions. So in your professional judgment, you'll say, oh, well, gosh, you know, we really need somebody that can help give us some history on this person mm -hmm. or, or help us out with that. So that's the reason why you're wanting that, to really help with the family and friends type of thing. Um, but yeah, they, there can be people that really want to get lost. <laughs> and so if you think that person is in their right mind and they're asking you to do that, try to respect that. But understand this, if you tell that patient, we won't tell anybody, now you run the risk of somebody else in your organization sharing that after you said you won't. So what you would need to do is, is have some centralized place that every, if, you do, if you agree to do that, you need to have some centralized place where everybody knows, or whoever's operating the call system or anything like that, where everybody knows that. Otherwise, you're telling the patient you won't do it, but somebody else over here who's really trying to be helpful is doing it. Mm -hmm. So you kind of have to be careful with that. And in the emergency, that, that's really hard to do. Um, we have in our agency um, a request for, you can, you can have a request for these um, confidential communications as, as a part of our HIPAA policy. But we have to, there's paperwork that you have to fill out, and we have to agree to that. And it's really hard to do because when you're, my thought is whenever you have people that are operating in their normal course, when you pull them off of that, there's an opportunity for mistake. Right. So unless there's some extreme reason why we need to take that person's file and put it up somewhere um, to make sure that we don't disclose it after we've said we wouldn't, then we have to be very careful about making those types of decisions. Okay. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. <laughs> it does. Do we have any other questions or any phone calls? Come on, I'm okay. not biting. <laughs> <laughs> well, Samari, I thank you so much for joining us today. And for those who may be watching, if you need to, re to uh, view this on demand, it will be available in a couple of days. Thank you all.